Hi. So we're done. It's time. Uh, we, we, you know, you guys got through it. Good for you. Now all you got to do is just show up and get babysat. Or if you're a teacher, do a little bit of babysitting until June and then summer break. Check it out. I just put up a second poll question. I want to know, uh, the ones of you who are here right now, um, which test did you take? Because they did something that, man, I would have told you if I would have known. But I, I had no idea. Nobody knew. They they gave an East Coast test, which was set one. They gave a West Coast test, which was set two. This is because all y'all are going to be going on Twitter and putting up the answers to help people on the West Coast, which really there's no incentive to do that. I guess it's just you trying to get credit or something. I, I, I don't mean you guys. I, mean, I know no no you guys on Five Board are going to do this. But there were people – Every single year, you'd always be able to check Twitter and see FRQs. So that's the reason why they made that choice. I want to know which one you guys did because that's the ones we're going to start with today. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to go in the order that I have them here on my paper. Uh, but what I wanted to do, just to give you guys a little bit of insight while you are catching up with me here, um, I wanted to go over uh, uh, what I think they were looking for for the FRQ. What's up? And here's the thing. I can tell you what I think they were looking for, but at the end of the day, nobody know what's going to be on that rubric until we get the rubric. And I think that I just saw today. I do. Sarthak, I have no idea how to pronounce your name. Uh, Mo 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 Mohanty? Yeah, I remember you for sure. I, uh, you, you guys, I mean, y'all are like my own, my own students. I mean, you guys come up. Uh, I, I, did, I did it right? Cool. So, uh, yeah, I was telling my wife, you know, after it was all said and done, I wasn't sure if I was going to be doing this or not today. And uh, it just feels good to be able to have an impact on you guys, you know. Uh, I treat you like my own students, and, and I've gotten to know some of you through this, and it's been a really cool experience. So go ahead if you had not already done it. Let me know which test question you did. Um, I got some teachers on here. I got some students. Uh, the food desert one was weird. Yeah, we're going to look at that. So I guess you were on the East Coast. Uh, so... Um, I want, to, I want to take a look at all of them as, as I can. Now, I will tell you, uh, I saw a lot where people were on um, the Haiti and Dominican Republic one. Which one was that? Hope I, didn't miss, I hope I didn't uh, miss that. Huh, I didn't see that. Haiti and Dominican Republic. Okay, so perhaps... Oh, it was, okay. It was a multiple choice question. So um, here's the thing with that. I'm never going to know what that question was. Um, I can't see the test. And actually, you guys aren't really even supposed to talk about that with me. So, um, uh, but uh, I'm sure, I mean, you guys probably talked about it with your with some of your friends or if you have a chance to you know, maybe mention to your teacher or something like that. Um, I mean, I'll ask any question, but don't, don't craft it in as a, this was a multiple choice question. So um, what was the answer to this? If you can figure out a way to, to kind of fit it in as just a general question so that I can answer it without talking about the test, I'm more than willing to, to try to address that. But um, uh, so, so I see that we got someone who was on the West Coast. Um, and I guess I, I need to account for anyone. I mean, I'm, I don't know. I don't even think we have access to the international test questions. So uh, I can't go over those because they're not released. Um, so if you took the question, if you took the test somewhere outside the U.S. Uh, where you didn't have any of the six released FRQs, then uh, you, uh, this probably isn't really going to be very helpful for you. Does College Board release? Um, the answer to that, Elizabeth, is no. Uh, actually, they've only released two since since the course has been a thing, and one of those was 2016. So um, the one before that, I think, was 2008. I want to say, and then there was a practice test prior to that. So it's only been three if you count the practice test, and that one's so old. Man, I don't know. You, you got a lot of other um, multiple choice, um, another AP classes where they have been more likely to release the questions. So one of the things with the new, I don't know if you guys know this, but coming up in the next year, they're changing a lot of stuff in the course description. They're kind of like um, revamping the course, which I think most teachers kind of feel like they need to change some things anyway. And uh, they're going to change the way the, the structure of the FRQ pretty dramatically. So all teachers are, are trying to figure this out. Um, but for multiple choice, my understanding is that there at some point this upcoming school year, are going to start giving um, access to college board written multiple choice questions so we can use those to help you. Of course, if you're a student right now, that's not going to be very helpful. But some of you guys watching this are teachers or will be teachers if you're watching the recording. And so 
just uh, know that. Uh, uh, probably wasn't that bad. Hopefully, you, you're, you're going to get a few points here. Okay. So it looks like um, – and I've still got a lot more people, but it looks like um, I've only got three people that took my poll about the FRQ. Y'all want me to start with the West Coast? We can do it. Devolution one was hard. Yeah. Yeah, these some of them were tough. Now, here's the thing. And, and, oh, I was telling, I was saying two things before we get started. I, and I'll, I'll promise I'm always here time. Um, number one, I've been told that the that the um, no, I don't know if they'll do it. Uh, look for the rubric, the writing guide for these questions sometime over the summer. I, I don't know when they're going to put them up. I know that the writing or the reading is going to be the week of wherever June 8th is going to be somewhere in that ballpark area. That's when teachers are going to be reading your, your essays. I don't know if the, if the um, rubric will come out before that or not, but if you guys want to actually see how this thing was graded, check back with the College Board um, FRQs for 2019, and, and uh, you may very well see the marking guide, which will tell you the answers. Happy birthday. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I think this would be the best time of the year for birthday. All right. The other thing I want to mention is that there are some te some uh, teachers and students saying stuff like, holy crap, the West Coast was way harder than the East. And you know what? <laughs> I think the hardest questions were, were definitely the West Coast. Um, however, however, know that that does not mean that everyone on the East Coast is going to pass the test and no one on the West Coast is going to. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to have a way of, of making it fair. Uh, and I don't know how that is. It's too mathematical for me. And I'll and you're probably not privy to such knowledge anyway, but every year, historically, they've had some kind of a curve that they would put where they're going to make it so that the number of kids passing is, 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 is fair. You're looking at college material. This is the reason why a lot of kids can make like a, a I don't know, a 60 or 65 on multiple choice and still be in a good place for a four on the AP exam. So just know that it will be fair the way they grade it. I don't think you're going to see where, you know, 60% of the East Coast passes and 33% of the West does. Um, they have not. That is a brand new thing. Uh, like I was saying earlier, the reason they do that is because um, there is four hour difference. So if kids on the East Coast start taking the uh, the FRQ by nine o'clock, it's going to be eight o'clock central. And so they're going to start tweeting about the answers and stuff. And uh, they get scores canceled and all that, but it gives people in the West an unfair advantage whenever people in the East, with absolutely no incentive whatsoever, give away all the answers. So that's the reason why they decided to do that, and they told no one, as far as I know. All right, so um, a few more people have, have done this. We're going to go ahead and start with what I've got right here. And I want to go ahead and make it so you guys can see. I'm going to apologize in advance for my terrible handwriting, but uh, I think we can get through it. What I've done is I've kind of copied the questions over here and then I've uh, written out not a response to them, but kind of an outline. Uh, if I was taking the test, I would have outlined maybe not this much detail, but this is something like how you would set up your response. And so good job. That, that's exact, I mean, That's a really good thing to do for sure because it gets you, you know, you, you lay out your thoughts. Then all you got to do is explain. So let's take a look. I've also highlighted a few things on this document. I'm hoping everyone can see that. The teacher always made a surprise. That, that's a good teacher right there. Um, to be honest with you, I probably didn't do enough of a job getting my students to do that. Uh, okay, in the early 21st century, food security is an increasingly important issue in, I underlined it, developing countries. That means places like the United States, food security. You don't think about this place being a place where people are going, are going to be hungry. Uh, some neighborhoods in the United States cities have been characterized as food deserts. Now, listen to this, guys. They define food desert in the next sentence. I hope you all saw this. Food deserts are areas with little or no access to healthy and affordable food right, and or limited or no access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So they define that for you. Ladies and gentlemen, there were kids putting on the test stuff like there wasn't enough rain. And that's the reason why there was a food shortage. I'm not talking about an actual desert. You're, you're talking about a geographic region where people don't have access to healthy, affordable Fresh fruits, vegetables, good food, you name it. They only have access to like nasty stuff like Krispy Kreme or, or um, you know, Dollar General. We have, that's the grocery store. It's putting a lot of local grocery stores out of business, but there ain't nothing healthy there. So let's take a look at it. Um, food security, developed countries. Uh, there are mapping tools, okay, like GIS, but can you put GIS in and of itself for this question? Look at this. A is asking, describe what kinds of information geographers use to map deserts. 
It's not asking for the tool in and of itself. So if you put just GIS, you're not going to get the point for that. You need to be able to explain the kind of data or the kinds of information that they would put into a GIS in order to map it. And that's going to look to me like, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. You're not the only one in here. That, that may have, have missed that. And again, I'm just speaking based on what I'm thinking they're asking for. I do not have a marking guide. Nobody has a marking guide. So, I mean, I'm just telling you what I think. Uh, it, it could be, it could be, you know, whatever, they, whatever they're going to put on there will be official. So demographic data. You want to look and make sure if, if the question puts this in there, the question says, uh, uh, you know, food deserts, little or no access to healthy or affordable food. So you want to know what kind of people or in the area, social economic status, how much income they might make, um, what maybe even the uh, if it's a minority group in that region, um, uh, what kinds of other businesses might be there? Uh, are there grocery stores? Like, let's look at this. Are there grocery stores um, and accessible fruits and veggies for everyone, regardless of income? So you might want to be able to map out what grocery stores and what farmers markets might exist. Um, how accessible is the nearest grocery store? So this is hugely important. Other barriers might be something like, um, yeah, no, that's, that's really good. Uh, other things might be stuff like um, if there's a lot of traffic and you got cars, great. But if you, there's a lot of traffic and you're walking, um, it's not going to be very conducive for people in the area to go to that place. And so it's not going to be accessible. I really do feel like if you've got something like what I've got here, I think that you might be okay on this question. Right? Uh, uh, it's, it's pretty you know, I don't think it's hard to the visual to think about this. If you know what a food desert is, the reasons why it might be inaccessible are, are going to be very similar to why anything might be inaccessible, to be honest with you. So I feel like for part A, anything kind of in that category might might work for this. Now, I know I got some teachers on here and some other students that might have other things. If that's you, we got a small crowd today, so feel free to put it in the comments. And, and uh, uh, if you want to put it in the questions, you can do that too. But feel free to tell me what you put or ask me questions or tell me stuff that or tell the group things I might not be thinking of. Um, so so any of that stuff might work. All right. <clears throat> Part B, you're looking for an identification and explain. Identify and explain two. So you have to have two IDs and then two explanations and an explanation per each ID in order to get all the points for this. This would be a, a four point section um, or at least that's how I'm thinking it would be. Uh, a point for the idea and a point for the explanation. Identify, explain two reasons food deserts exist in urban areas with, um, well, hang on, let me pull it up on my phone. Um, uh, or let me look it up real quick. I'm not sure why the question got cut off. Let me, let me just look it up real quick. Okay, so it came back. All right, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try, try not to move around too, too much. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Question still never came back. Okay, so what I put for part B, and the, the question's kind of cut off there, but I'm looking at um, development of businesses that compete with space where stores could be, okay? So it's looking for um, what are some things that might contribute to, uh, if, if, somebody gets a, if somebody gets a chance to look at this question, if you Google, um, I'm gonna put you guys to work for me, Google uh, 2019 APHG FRQ set, one, if y'all can, if you can do that and type in the uh, the second, the last part of, of, of B there, that would be really helpful. Hopefully it'll come up, but you know, if I, if I can't get it to come up, I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time waiting for it. But uh, look at this, um, development of businesses that compete with the space where stores could be, lack of walkability leading to lack of access. So these are, these are things here that are going to prevent, um, they're going to cause, okay, within developed countries. Thank you so much. Um, which makes me, and that and that's really actually that's extremely key. So I'm so glad that you were able to go in there and read that. Uh, that that's the key to it. All right. Uh, identify, explain two reasons why food in urban areas. And if you if you didn't explain it in the context of developing countries, you wouldn't get a point for that. Or developed countries, you wouldn't get a point for this. I can promise you that. Um, so that's a very very important part of the question. So lack of walkability, and also it's talking about urban areas, right? Y'all catch that? So you're looking at cities. So if a place, if you can't walk to it, that might lead to issues of access. That would be your ID. Um, ID number two, development of businesses that compete with space where stores can be. Talking about grocery stores, looking at things like entertainment, looking at things like restaurants, Starbucks or Fru Fru coffee shops or, or Froyo shops or front door, what did I got there? Front door services like banks and companies. So there, um, any of that stuff there is going to compete with 
where a grocery store could be. And if you have a lot of that stuff there and people can't get to the grocery store, grocery store is going to close down, right? So you end up seeing a lot of those issues there that might prevent access. Number three, traditional stores and markets may have a hard time competing with new stores like Publix or Whole Foods, right? Jocelyn, that's okay. I mean, sometimes there, I mean, and I bet you when the Rupert comes out you're, or the marketing guy, whatever they call it, you're probably going to see a bunch of uh, stuff here that I, I can't think of either. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're doing this is because it's not about knowing at all. It's about knowing what to put to get as many points as you can. Um, traditional stores and markets are going to close down. They're going to have a hard time competing with new things like Publix or Whole Foods. If you watch the news, you probably already heard of Dollar General. Everywhere Dollar General goes, especially in rural areas, and we're talking about urban, but it's in urban areas as well, they tend to put out local or put local businesses out of business. Um, and Dollar General don't sell no lettuce and tomatoes or any of that stuff. It's, it's super cheap, nasty food that contributes to food deserts all over the place. Um, grocery stores can't compete with the Dollar General in that way. Uh, I put low paying jobs as the reason why people can't buy organic food, which is more expensive. That is true. Let's look back at the question real quick and see. And then I explain two reasons why food deserts exist in urban areas with developed countries. Um, I don't know if you could relate that directly to the geographic region, though, which is, is we're asking about the food desert as if it's a geographic region. So I, I, I don't know. We'll have to see. But I think that that would be um, junk food is cheaper. Uh, I don't, that would be maybe a um, that would probably be, in my mind, um, a side effect of the replacing of grocery stores with things like Dollar General or whatnot. But I don't think that that would be counted as a reason for the food desert, because if I mean, if junk food is cheaper and they choose to buy junk food because of that, that's not exactly the same as not having access to the healthy and affordable food that is, would be good for you. So you're right when you say that it's cheaper and some people are going to buy donuts and pizza for their kids because you can go to Little Seasons and get it for six bucks. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're looking at the access to the food. Uh, I think that's the main key here. Now, for the, ex for the explanations, um, you would simply have to dig in a little bit here and explain these IDs. So I didn't really write those out. But if you're looking at walk, lack of walkability, an explanation for that would be people that don't have cars or people that can't afford public transportation or whatever it might be or live several blocks away and have to cross a lot of streets, they may not be able to access a store due to um, to the, 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 the traffic or due to lack of, of, of uh, transportation, um, leading to them not having access. You got to relate to that, having access to good food and affordable food. Um, developing up businesses. You look, at, look at things like gentrification. Um, a lot of these uh, poor neighborhoods that might have local, locally owned um, grocery stores or farmers markets get put out of business when there is all these different coffee shops and, and things that usually appeal to higher income families in, in terms of their entertainment and things like that. So I, I, I could spend time and try to give an explanation for each of those if you want me to. Uh, maybe just the last one there. Um, number three, traditional stores and markets have a hard time competing. That's the one we just not kind of gave an explanation for. When you when you locate a Dollar General and they can lower prices to a point that grocery stores can't compete, they're going to close down. And there's a lot of grocery stores in my region in South Carolina, like Piggly Wiggly, Winn Dixie, Bilo, uh, uh, Food Lion. All these places are going out of business because they can't keep up with the big names in like places like Publix, and Kroger, and Walmart. Uh, Walmart is, is, a, is a major deal because of how cheap they're able to sell due to their wholesale prices. Um, and they have everything there. So people will go there over anything else. The, the one exception to this, and I just read an interesting article about it, is Audi. I don't know if you guys know about Audi, but they cut all kinds of costs to the point that even Walmart can't compete with their pricing simply because they strip it down. You got to work when you go in there. You got to pay for your buggy. You got you to bag your own groceries. It's, a, it's an experience. I'm glad my wife likes to do all that because uh, it saves me money. Uh, we shop at Aldi. Okay. For part C, I put an impact of food deserts are increased health problems such as obesity. Well, let's take, let's take a look. Did that answer part C? Jeez Louise, did I miss it? All right. Identify and explain one impact of living in a food desert. Um, I feel like what you've got there, Patricia, would be a good response to that. I don't know why. I, I guess I missed part C in terms of my outline. But yeah, I think that that would be um, Audi, A-L-D-I. 
there's another one called Lidl, which is kind of the same thing. They're German-based stores. I don't know if that's a cultural thing, but but Audi is this the one exception there. Um, I think, Patricia, what you've got there is a pretty good uh, uh, response. If you lived in a food desert, identify and explain one impact of living there. Um, yeah, there might be worse health. Uh, you might not have access to healthy veggies, which means there might be uh, uh, more obesity or more uh, health-related problems. Um, uh, 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 what else did you guys put? Um, for Part C, I put poor nutrition and increased death rate. Um, I think that with the increased death rate, you'd have to link that back somehow to, uh, as part of your explanation, um, the identify, let's see, the impact. Yeah, so so if you put that in there, you you definitely would want to explain. And, and that might be something. I don't really know if food desert would be something that would contribute in a sizable way to a death rate or to a life expectancy. Um, yeah, I guess we only know when the rubric comes out. That's probably not the way I would answer it. But if you talk about poor nutrition, which could lead to different types of health uh, um, effects, such as death in some of the most extreme cases, then perhaps they might take that as part of your explanation. But I, was, I would definitely say poor nutrition would, would be one of the IDs for sure. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, I guess we'll, we'll just have to see whenever the marking guide comes out. But if you crapped it the way I kind of just said and said poor nutrition as your ID and then linked it to an explanation, um, then you, you may you may be OK. All right. So hopefully hopefully we'll see that. Hopefully we'll see that. Yeah. Hopefully they all got it right, too. Um, that sure would be cool. OK. Number two, um, infant mortality rates. All right. So here's the here's a map. Now, somebody was asking me in one of our reviews leading up to this test, um, what all would you need to know in terms of do I need to memorize countries or states or cities? And the, 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 the response I gave was, no, you don't need to memorize them all, but you need to know individual countries within individual regions. All right. This is why. The, the example from last year is another reason why. When they asked about um, women in, in African countries and nobody knew African countries, well, once again, in this case here, you got to know, you know, not, not really, it's not African uh, countries is asking about. It's, it's really focusing on, what is it, Europe, Western Europe, and South Asia. So let's take a look. I know it's kind of small. Um, identify the predominant ranges of infant mortality rate found in South Asia and Western Europe. This is going to be really easy for the reader because there is one set right answer to this question, and either you get it or you don't. It's going to be worth one point. So... It is, the, the map is showing in South Asia, okay? It's showing between 15 and 59, if you look at the map key, between 15 and 59, because South Asia is going to be all of this, India, uh, Pakistan, even Afghanistan might count as that. Well, no, I wouldn't count Afghanistan. I would say, I'd say it's more Middle East, or um, but you've got all of South Asia. Um, I don't think I, I think that they'll give it to you for 15 to 59. That's that's what the question is, w w would be. Um, and the reason is because uh, if you look at. Well, yeah, if you look right here, you got Nepal in there with a 15 to 30. Right? Yeah. And this region here where my mouse is, is definitely South Asia. So so that's the reason why it, Nepal is definitely in the 15 to 29 range. So that's the reason why I would say 15 to 59, because. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh are, are, are going to be in the 30 to 59 range. So, again, I can't say for certain what's going to be on the marking guide, but uh, almost, I mean, I can say that the way I would answer it is I would put 15 to 59 uh, uh, due to the two different shadings you see in South Asia. Um, Okay, in Western Europe, it's going to be 2 to 14. It is a big range. And that's and you know what? 2 to 14 is a big range because if you look over here, this map is kind of misleading in that it makes it look like this is really good. 2 to 14, that's low. Everything's white. Awesome. Here's the bottom line. A, a birth rate in a developed country. I'm, no, I'm sorry. A, a, a infant mortality rate, which is the any death between 0 and 1 year old. Um, an infant mortality rate between uh, around seven to eight in the developed country is really high. If you're looking at anything nine or 10, it, God forbid 14, that's in, that's that's newsworthy um, infant mortality rate, okay? That's really high. The American South, so where I live in South Carolina, the entire South region has the highest infant mortality rates in 
uh, the developed world. And it's somewhere around nine to 10, maybe 11, depending on what state you're looking at, uh, per thousand kids being born, uh, which is terrible, right? It's really bad. And that's re and then it's even worse when you look at subgroups like African Americans. And that's the reason why, uh, that's the reason why it makes the news. So part B, economic reasons. The question says, describe two economic reasons. Describe two, all right? So this one's not saying identify and describe. It's saying simply describe two economic reasons for the level of infant mortality rates in Western Europe. Okay, there's, uh, I wrote four of what I think could work here, all right? Uh, number one, high education leads to more income that can be used to purchase health care. Now, again, you're describing, so you can't identify as more income and get a point for this. You've got to relate the more income, in my mind, is how I would tell you to write, more income has to relate to the purchasing of health care or um, some kind of a, of a um, something that's going to help the baby have a better chance of living. So that could be better housing. That could be um, air conditioning or better cribs or better materials that you put the baby in and all this kind of stuff. Those things can help uh, a baby can live longer and more income will help you to buy that. Does that make sense? Number two, um, educational opportunities mean more doctors making healthcare accessible. So if there's not doctors anywhere around, then you're not going to be able to, you're going you're to have low, you're going to have high um, infant mortality rates. Number three, more money is spent on health care through insurance employee benefits, making health care an expected norm, not a rare luxury. OK, so so uh, if you work in a developed country, you are probably going to have some kind of insurance. In fact, if you look at Europe, most of them have government policies forcing people to have health insurance, kind of like what we did with Obamacare. That's common in Europe. All right. So. Um, Number four, access to baby food, formula, and clean water due to better, um, more income or more money. Now, the reason why I keep relating it back to things like money is because notice this question is specifically asking for economic reasons for the level of infant mortality rates in Western Europe. If you don't list economic reasons, I promise you won't get a point for this. And that's going to be sad because I know a lot of people didn't do that. A lot of people are going to look over that word economic and write reasons, all right? And so uh, that's that's the problem uh, there. So you got to make sure that you read the question. Um, I'm going to highlight that right there because it's really important. Economic reasons. You have to list economic reasons for that. Number uh, uh, letter C. Um, identify and explain a specific way in which two. I'm sorry, in which uh, each of the following two United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are intended to affect infant mortality rate. Hey. Didn't I tell you guys that they were going to ask an uh, MDG or SDG kind of question on the test? I do believe you heard it here first. I've been saying it forever and a day. Heck yeah. Heck yeah, I did. So hopefully you guys weren't thrown too far off guard. I also told you it's not going to be about memorizing them, but about relating them to other units and how they might be seen at different scales. So if you guys listen to me about anything here, this question might have been not so terrible. Um, okay. So. Uh, let me read again. I did I explain a specific way in which each of the following two United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are intended to affect infant mortality rates in rural, rural, oh my gosh, must be rural community in South Asia. Not urban community anywhere, not rural community in Western Europe. It has to be about, about South Asia. And you might be thinking, what the heck? Because how in the world do you know anything about a South Asian rural community? Well, you do, and let's take a look and see why. Quality education. While we know about any developing country, one of the main problems is that they don't have access to quality education. How might that impact the infant mortality rate? Well, here we go. It could lead to more, more education leads to knowledge about how to care for babies. So by, by increasing quality education, you give people the knowledge on how to care for their kids also maybe even the knowledge on contraceptives and having less kids have less kids you can take care of them better because now your money goes further right um hopefully this thing is gonna is gonna load back load back in so i can see um another thing here is that with with the uh, again with the first with the first of the MDGs here or SDGs quality education, um, if you are especially a girl and you have access to quality education, you're going to spend time developing the opportunity for um, for for uh, you know opportunities for careers. You're going to go to school longer. 
statistically, if you go to school longer, you're not going to have babies when you're 15, 16, 17 years old. So you will have less children. Um, and you also have a job with, with uh, hang on, I'm sorry. I missed, uh, I missed it. Um, you, you'll end up having less, less children or wait until you're older. Um, uh, so it, it will result in kids being taken care of better. You also might have um, a, a, a more economically stable job is the other part of this year that I'm looking at. Now, um, it could also lead to better care for babies, including uh, access to health care because of less children. So you'd have to, you can't just say it would lead to less children. You have to relate that back to fixing the infant mortality rate, making it lower, all right, related to the uh, sustainable development goal. The other sustainable development goal is clean water and sanitation. And again, you must relate this to South Asia's rural communities. So we know you've seen plenty of um, documentaries where you got these ladies carrying buckets of water they walk eight miles to get on top of their head and they get it from a muddy hole in the ground. If they don't sanitize that junk or they don't sanitize it right, babies are gonna drink it, they're gonna die. I think that there was a pretty easy question to answer and explain in relation to clean water and sanitation, okay? Um, so kids could be infected with bacterial diseases and, and they might not make it. Okay, I bring this to question three on the East Coast. It's taking me a little longer to go through them, so hopefully we will speed it up. Um, if you have any questions, again, some of you guys are putting it out there in the comments. I, I was kind of uh, not paying attention to them, but uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay. All right, here we go. So the third question, you get a map, and you get a map of Spain and Nigeria. Now, uh, uh, this question here is probably the hard one on the East Coast. All right. Am I, am I right? Um, the number of states in the world has grown to approximately 200. It's not quite. It's almost there. The creation of new countries has been possible as a result of devolutionary forces. If you don't know what devolutionary forces is, this one's going to be hard. I'm not going to lie. You really need to know that vocab for this one. Okay. Countries such as Spain and Nigeria face devolutionary forces. Uh, 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 pressures. Okay, so define devolution. You get a point right off the bat for putting a, de a definition here. It's going to be the process by which a government is broken down from a central government to a, to autonomous rule by local or smaller governments. And if you wanted to, just to seal it in, you could give an example. But really what they're looking at and all they're looking at here is the definition of that word. Bam, you get one point for that. B, cultural. All right, so here's the thing. You got three different uh, indicators here. Describe how each of the following forces contributes to devolutionary pressures within a country. Cultural diversity, regional economic differences, physical geography. You have to relate them to how they contribute to devolutionary pressures. All right, so cultural diversity. People have different nationality. Let's see, wait, what, what can we put for devolution? Um, it's right here at the very top. That right there would be a, any definition that is centered on the idea of a government breaking down into smaller local governments or local autonomy or whatever it might might mean it's not it's not the same as balkanization it's just a breakdown of a central government into maybe more autonomous rule on a local regional level um that would be like like the, the united kingdom it's made up of the kingdom of of england or i guess uh, england scotland wales northern ireland that's the example of devolution all right um yes what's up um all right so Cultural diversity, there was a, a 2005 FRQ over development. I don't remember what that was. Um, oh, on, devolu on devolution, was there? I have, I, I have to go back and check and take a look at that. I don't, I don't remember it. It says Vulcan. Yeah. All right. So um, nationality, religion, language, these are all devolutionary forces. Nationality is what you see in the United Kingdom. They all speak English, right? I mean, we can't even tell their accents usually. But, but in all honesty, they're a completely different nation. They believe different things politically. They do have different accents. Um, 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 any, so, so that's a good example there. Uh, religion, language, all these things lead to a desire for some degree of autonomy and self-representation, which could lead to uh, a, a central government saying, okay, we're going to give them a little bit more of a right to rule themselves. We're going to give them some degree of autonomy. Um, for regional economic differences, uh, 
you've got some regions within a state that might say, hey, we want to be our own country, or we might want more say in government or more benefits of our of our economy because they're well off. OK, so so a perfect example of this is Barcelona in Spain, which is actually on the map. That's one of the devolutionary places you could talk about is Catalonia. The capital there is Barcelona. These guys have recently quite illegally voted themselves to be independent. All right. My teacher kind of talked about Catalonia. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and that's what I was going to say is, man, I, even I probably would struggle talking specifically about about the problems in Nigeria. And you got Boko Haram, you got a huge amount of diversity, but I don't know enough about that to craft a response to this question. But when it comes to Spain, you got not only Catalonia, you also have the Basque country up here. You've got these other groups here. I wouldn't really talk about those, but definitely Catalonia and the Basque country. Um, how do you care what Basque are? It's a, it's a small, they're the only um, speakers of a non-Indo-European language left in Europe period. They speak a language called Euskara, which is not related to any other language in the world. It predates the Indo-European expansion that happened as far back as 5000 BC, depending on which theory you're looking at. So that's it's, they're very, very unique culturally. And that's they have even had terrorist groups that is uh, centered on um, separatism there. Uh, and that goes back a long way. Right now, it's, it's relatively calm as far as I know. But Catalonia has been in the news recently. So that's the one I would go with. All right. So if they're well off economically, they, they don't want to carry the rest of the country. So they may want their own uh, level of autonomy or even straight up to be their own country. So that might lead to devolutionary forces. Other examples would be Flanders in Belgium. Flanders is better off than Wallonia. Um, Quebec is, re is relatively well off in Canada. They also have French as their primary culture. And so you, you've seen refer there's been referendums for Quebec to be their own country. Um, Scotland wants to remain the EU. Well, they just in 2014 decided, hey, we're going to stay part of the United Kingdom. And then the United Kingdom votes to leave out of the EU and Scotland wanted to stay in. So you might see another referendum there where the Scots have a chance to vote themselves into their own independent nation. All right. Part C. Let's see. Um, let's see. Or explain. Let's see. Uh, do we need to give an example? Describe how each of the following forces contribute. Man, this is one where I probably would give an example if you can. So I wouldn't put something that you're unsure about and just spout off crap. But if you can relate it to some kind of a, of a event to make the reader know, hey, this person knows it. You want to seal the deal. Absolutely. I would give examples if you can, but the question does not call for them. It does call for a description. So you got to keep that in mind. Physical geography uh, and territorial size. I'm sorry, hang on. Uh, yeah, we missed that one. Um, some groups can feel isolated. If you're on an island or if you're part of an archipelago or if you're in a big uh, place like Russia, for example, and you got different groups that live along, along the bottom, um, along the southern border there, they're going to be unique. They're going to want their own uh, uh, representation. So you could see that there as well. I also have um, lack of representation. The Kurds would be a really good group uh, example of a group that might want um, self-governance or some degree of autonomy within a larger region. Right? And that would actually span over multiple states. Uh, I have a question. Let's take a look at it. Question, question, question. All right. Um, for the explain point, do we have to provide examples or no? Uh, yeah, I saw that just now in the comment. Um, not necessarily, but uh, it's good to be able to to use vocabulary and give actual examples. So I'm gonna say you can go for it, but don't just you know put something that's not related to the question because then the, the reader will see, hey, this person doesn't really understand. Um, so 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 yeah, I, I would I would I would if I could if I could give an example I would. All right, um, let's see. Must know specifics. So if you're looking at part C, explain, identify and explain, identify and explain one political impact resulting from devolutionary forces or pressures related to cultural differences in either Spain or Nigeria. We've already said that Spain would be the easy one there because most of our teachers have spent more time studying that. So if you want to look at Spain, you can look at Catalonia. They're very wealthy. So you've got the regional uh, economic differences there. Uh, they're also linguistically different. They don't speak sp uh, Spanish. They speak another version of Romance language, Catalon uh, Cat Catalan. Catalan. Um, which is kind of like Spanish, but not exactly the same. It's like a dialect, all right? So um, they're culturally different. They recently voted illegally 
for independence, and then the government like cracked down and arrested a bunch of leaders there for doing that. Um, they also called for countries like the U.S. to recognize them, and we were like, heck no, because when Texas secedes, we don't want anybody to recognize that. That'd be a slap in the face. So nobody recognized them. Um, Euskara is the Basque language, and they are non-European, non-Indo-European, and they wish for autonomy as well. So you can put that there too. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll take a look at that and start back as soon as I get done uh, with this for sure. Okay, so um, we're 40 minutes in. We're getting to the West Coast. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a uh, we'll go through this a little quicker. And it, it looks like it will take us a little bit longer than an hour. Um, but I wanted to make sure I went over both uh, sets here. So, uh, and I wrote a little bigger for this one uh, accidentally. So we'll we'll adjust to that. Many developed countries have deindustrialized and are transitioning to a post-industrial economy. Okay, I will go ahead and tell you. I can. I will. Yeah, I'll go through them all. I'll go through them all. Um, all right, this right here to me is the hardest question out of all six. To me, this right here is the one I thought was the hardest. Now I'm going to tell you straight up what I have here may or may not be what they're looking for. And that's the truth for any of these questions. But um, you know, this right here would have been the one I thought was the hardest. All right. So identify and describe the economic sector that becomes dominant when a country's de when a country deindustrializes and restructures from an industrial to a post-industrial economy. All right. So you need to you need to know economic sectors. You need to know deindustrialization, and you need to understand what it means by post-industrial economy. Now, don't worry. Even if you didn't know what these are, honestly, they're kind of like how they sound. When you talk about deindustrialization, you're looking for a move from factories and production within the CBD to something else. And we talked about economic sectors, right? So what economic sector are they moving to? In the developed world, it is always services. So you could call it services, you could call it tertiary. If you were gonna look at tertiary, I would also mention quaternary, okay? You don't necessarily need to put quaternary because that's not gonna be related to deindustrialization. But any kind of, of tertiary and quaternary services is what's going to be replacing the, 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 the factories. And, and that's what we're looking at. Industrial means factories, post-industrial means whatever is gonna come afterwards, right? Post, which in this case is gonna be services. So you gotta know a little bit about, this is a unit six and unit seven question in my mind. So let's take a look. Identify and describe the economic sector that becomes dominant. It's gonna be tertiary and quaternary. All right, you could probably put services and get away with it. Um, as opposed to something like uh, secondary or manufacturing or or um, farming. Um, and that's a, that's the simple part. Um, all right, so part B, describe two ways countries transitioning to a post-industrial economy utilize the international division of labor. Now, what that means is that if you look at the core periphery model, and I think this is what I talked about in the reviews, um, you've got your core states, those are going to be the ones that are high in quaternary services. Then you've got your semi-periphery, which is basically doing the majority of the manufacturing today. Places like India, Bangladesh, uh, Mexico, China. Those would be your, your newly industrialized countries or your semi-periphery. And then you've got your periphery, which is like your sub-Saharan Africa, parts of South Asia which are, or Southeast Asia, which are going to be doing like your, your agriculture. And they also have resources. So when you think about the international division of labor, you're thinking about... In this context, uh, uh, companies in the United States and these that are going to locate in these cities with their front door offices are going to outsource. Or I guess they're going to really the word is offshore their production of their materials into factories and places where the labor is cheap. So that means people in the in the poor countries are going to be making or, or I guess producing the good. Um, people are going to be making decisions about those goods in the, the cities in these deindustrialized cities. And then um, you might have resources or whatever it might be coming from some of your periphery countries. So anything, that's, that's what we're looking at when we look at the international uh, um, division of labor, is that really what we've done in the world of globalization is poor, poor people do all the manual labor stuff. They make stuff in the factories, all right? Uh, rich people are the ones who sit behind a desk and, and, and provide the, I guess, upper level of the services by being the thinkers, being the ones who who uh, 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 work with the software and make the adjustments and, and control everything maybe from a central hub. So what's happening just in short is in these deindustrialized uh, uh, cities, right, they're being replaced by you know, technopoles, for example, like uh, Silicon Valley or in Manhattan, you've got places like Google and Amazon thinking about going there and locating so that they can tap into the to labor force there. So um, 
in, in Charlotte, it's banking and other services are a big deal there post industry. And so these are some of the things that you're seeing here. Um, there are, the second part of B, rise in specialization in regions. Like I just now said, um, Manhattan could be a technopole. Silicon Valley is definitely a technopole. It's the best example of that. It's also an example of agglomeration, remember? Um, Boeing, all right? You've got uh, you know Boeing airplanes are assembled in um, uh, near Silicon Valley, right? But parts of the assembly of the many pieces that go into an airplane might be assembled in other in other states or in other countries, right? So they're all 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 of these are examples of people that are going to tap into the international uh, uh, division of labor because you don't see Americans doing the the manufacturing. You know, we, we charge too much. They they want to outsource that to places like special economic zones or Makila doors that will do it way cheaper with a bigger smile on their face. And, and and so that's that's what you're gonna see there. Um, let's see, part C, describe one way in which the roles of women in the paid labor force of developed countries change as a result in the transition to a post-industrial economy. All right, uh, I'm gonna tell you straight up, I, I, I'm not 100% sure what they're asking for here, or, or, or I, I'm not sure how to convey it. I don't know, I don't know what they're gonna look for for this response. So I did my best in terms of how I would I would set it up. Um, when you look at developed countries or these post-industrial countries, and, and keep in mind also that these questions are not talking about specific cities. They're talking about post-industrial um, economies of countries. So you're looking at the country as a whole. In a country like the United States today, most women are going to be employed, but they're not necessarily employed in jobs like being CEOs of tech companies, or they're not engineers, or they're not doctors they're more likely to be something like a teacher or a nurse so in my mind that's what they're asking and, and for better or for worse that's that's what i went with so women tend to be employed in specific fields like education retail nursing for example but not in stem jobs such as engineering and medical you might can take that a little further if it asks for it and talk about how um women don't make as much as as men in some of these roles you might also talk about, because it's talking about the role of women in the paid labor force. Um, I don't really think this would be related to the role of women in the paid labor force, but you might can mention as part of your description there, women, um, uh, you know, taking more time to take care of kids, for example. So I probably would not mention that because I don't think it relates directly to what the question is asking. But that that's really odd. But anybody else have something better to put for that? I mean, if y'all do, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um because that, that's the question there that I feel like I can't wait to see the marking guide because I think I'm probably not quite where I need to be in terms of how I would craft my response there. Um, the last part of the question is uh, a very subtle statement in the course description mentions brownfields. Um, so I always made a, a point to teach my students about brownfields. Um, and it was actually covered in our review as well. But brownfields are going to be old factory buildings or, or areas where industries happen that industries no longer happen. And so your, 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 your factories are just left there as an old empty shell. And some of them have been there for decades, right? Um, Justin, I don't know, but it'll probably be sometime over the summer. Uh, my guess is it would be after the reading because the, the, the teachers are going to use the marking guide to mark the questions on the week of June 8th. Um, and, and I'll be honest, like sometimes they, they might, they don't usually, but they, they, may, they may make changes to the marking guide um leading up to that um or maybe even in some cases <laughs> very early in the week and so um because of that i don't think you're going to see it until after the reading so it'll probably be late june or july about the same time as you'll get your your, your test results um so brownfields sometimes are converted into uh condos so what they will try to do in columbia south carolina is a really good example of this is they'll take some of the old manufacturing buildings and they'll leave the shell and they'll leave it there in all its antiquity and they'll modernize it a little bit, make it look all pretty. And then they'll make just extravagant condominiums in the inside and sell it to small families with a lot of income that might come back in and help revamp or revitalize the city. And so you see brown fuels being converted into those. You also see brown fuels being converted into green spaces, which are going to be like park areas or areas where there's not development. So they'll tear all that junk down and say, this old eyesore, we're, gonna, we're going to make it look like something pretty, make it look like something where people are gonna wanna walk and move about. So it'll, it'll be very much part of the urban renewal plan or maybe part of the, uh, the uh, smart urban growth 
plan that feeds into one of the later questions later on down the line. So that's how I would address um, D, where it says describe two ways in which brownfields can be redeveloped. And honestly, I can't think of too many ways other than that, to be honest. Uh, so hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully those would work. All right, the second question on uh, is, is on the uh, Galactic City model, okay? And, and I spent a little bit of time looking at this. Even still, I feel like this is the second hardest question out of all six of them. Um, so, so this one here is, uh, and it's tough really because again, you don't know. I don't know exactly how they're going, how they, how they, they want it. Maybe I just didn't have enough time as I'm looking through this to really meditate on this question. Well, let's take a look. All right. So you see the Galactic City model. It was um, Her uh, Chauncey Harris's extension to the multiple nuclei model, and we'd already talked about how you've got your your your, your beltways. Um, you've got your interstates and things like this. And then at these, some of these intersections, you will see where you might have things like malls. And around those malls or those office buildings or you name it, there would eventually be um, a lot of urbanization that would uh, almost start acting like its own little suburban city on the periphery of the bigger city. All right. So that's really what you're looking at with, with the edge cities of the Galactic City model. So describe two factors that led to the development of the Galactic City as an urban landscape in North America. Um, I think that what they're looking for is going to be automobile transportation. Um, and you could probably say interstates as the same idea or possibly as a separate, as a separate reason, but I would put those two together. Automobile and, and, and interstates uh, made it where people were driving more and things that were, would typically uh, not exist on the periphery of the city began to emerge due to people moving out that way. So you've got suburban sprawl. You've got new retail um, centered on urban populations on the periphery of the city, which is going to lead to these edge cities. Um, things like malls, things like airports, any of that stuff could work for, for that. Number two, I would link it to suburban sprawl. Okay, So where people are going to live, you're going to see retail airports, office space emerge as a result of the people living in those areas. And so city center was seen as a place to work not to live. This is the reason why some of those places, some of these large cities, the CBD, might be hustling and bustling during the day, but at night, ironically, there's going to be basically no one there because they all move into the city to work, and then they go back on the periphery at night to live out their lives. All of these cities here are the city model. And again, I hope I'm, I hope that's what they're asking for. Uh, again, I can't wait until the, the Galactic City Model comes out. Hey, hey girl, are you going to tell me not not? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh. You night. wave and say hi. Wave and say hi in the camera. Say night night. Night night. Love you. There you go. Uh, you be good. <laughs> Stein type time over here in the Fallock household. There we go. Okay. Um, and my oldest is probably going to come in here in a second too. Uh. Okay, so part B, describe two ways that spatial organization of commercial land use is different between original central business district and edge city. All right, now this one here is kind of getting into your um, new new urbanism in a little bit. All right, so in the central business districts, they're looking at uh, mixed zoning. And, and this one here is probably the, the number one thing that I think they're asking, they're, they're looking for here. Mixed zoning. That means you're going to have shops and houses in the same buildings in the same place on the same street. So uh, uh, you see this more in cities today, especially as you have your urban renewal projects going on and trying to bring more people to the city. In edge cities, they're all they're going to be um, they're going to be separate usually. All right, and again, I don't have a whole lot of experience looking at real edge cities. I'm going by what, what I think they're asking for. So that's the reason why this question is a little bit more difficult. Um, but yeah, I think that that's what they're looking. That's one of the things you could say. Um, other, another thing is that CBDs are going to be vertical. There's going to be taller buildings, all right? And edge cities, since they're more on the periphery, the way they emerge was as a result of urban sprawl and mixed zoning. So they're going to be a little bit flatter. There's not going to be as much um, uh, a straight up like vertical same building kind of, of stuff going on here. Also, they're going to be separate buildings for different kinds of businesses, a car dealership, um, a grocery store, a, uh, a, a whatever else it might be, a bookstore. Sometimes you might have uh, strip malls that might have uh, uh, different types of restaurants or, or a barber shop or um, something like that all in one place, but they're usually flat, a lot of parking lot space and things that kind of are conducive for driving and, and not so much walking, which is my third reason here. So edge cities are more spread out 
and they are car dependent. They are car dependent as opposed to um, being more of a walkable area, which is what we're looking for for CBDs. Okay. Part C describe one negative impact of edge C development on the environment. All right. Uh, the number one thing here that I will have listed is that more traffic leads to CO2 emissions. Now, please don't tell me that you only put more traffic and didn't link it to an environmental issue. So you had to actually link this to an environmental issue, which I can to you because it says one negative impact of edge C's on the environment. So if you can't relate it to the environment, it, it's not going to get a point there. I think traffic is the number one thing. Um, there's going to be maybe a few others. Rapid growth could mean commercial and urban development over what it used to be, maybe farmland. Um, and I put big question marks here because I don't know if that's going to work as a response. That's just uh, the only thing I can really think of that I think would work for that is the traffic and the CO2 and the pollutants and all that kind of stuff. So if you guys have other things y'all might have put, feel free to share it with me because I'm telling you, I just do a blank on that one. If I, if I would have been taking the AP exam, that right there is what they would, they would have gotten from me. Um, for better or for worse. Part D, explain two ways sustainable design, uh, sustainability again, um, initiatives or smart growth policies could address negative impacts of edge state development on the environment. So when you look at Part D, it does shed a little bit of light again to kind of give me confidence that traffic and CO2 emissions is a big part of what they're looking for for Part C because smart growth policies are going to be stuff centered on kind of like the new urbanism movement. It's going to be stuff centered on um, bringing down pollutants, um, bringing down traffic, um, bringing down the amount of cars and thus fatalities because of accidents or whatever it might be, improving health through a walkable environment. So all these things are going to be related to the response. So I think more emphasis on walkable landscapes discourage driving or is the number one thing you're going to want to see here. Um, have things like bikes, scooters, even though scooters are kind of controversial in and of themselves. Um, other things, you know, encourage people to skateboard or to rollerblade, whatever it might be. The cities have a lot of ability to, to, to promote this kind of thing if they use smart growth policies and think about, hey, let's let's make a walkable area in less lanes and a lower speed limit to discourage car use. And then in the process, we'll encourage uh, um, biking or we'll encourage walking or running or any of these other things. Um, and also another part of this would be more public transportation. And before you start thinking, whoa, well, buses are super polluting. Yeah, they are. But you also have like um, different types of, uh, of rail cars, for example, that aren't super polluting. Um, make those free or accessible or super cheap and get more and more people riding that instead of driving. And you might cut down traffic. And so they'd be able to travel faster with less uh, pollutants going into the air. You'd have a better... Um, atmosphere and a better, uh, more social both city in general. Um, other things would be like there's an awesome Vox video on um, uh, Super Vox. All right now, this one here is uh, we're, we're looking at edge cities, so I, I don't think that they would necessarily take the, the Super Eas or Super Blocks as, um, as, as part of this, but so honestly, I think that's probably the reason why I didn't put it in. And I'll go ahead and erase it as well. I don't, I don't think that's what they're looking for, but I mean. It might be. Who knows? All right. And that brings us to the final question. And, and, and it'll probably take me about 10 or 15 minutes or so when we'll be finished up. Um, but the final question is, number three, you got awesome map of Europe. And the super important thing here is it's not just a map of Europe, but it's a map of Europe with a very particular time frame. Okay. You are looking at 1980 through 2013 and nothing more, nothing less. So you have to be able to think, what is significant about this period? Somebody put in the comments, what's going on during this period primarily? What's probably the main thing that you can see on this map related to that time period? I'm only got a few of you still with me. So I'll go ahead and tell you. The number one thing they want you to see there is the Cold War, right? Um, you know, you, you, the Cold War is at its height, really. During this time, you got the Soviets, you got NATO. We talked about um, the Iron Curtain. We talked about the uh, Warsaw Pact and the NATO states. Basically, this right here is the Iron, your Iron Curtain. And I'm not just trying to be squiggly. I, I, I'm having a hard time drawing it. But this right here, all this would be 
um, your Warsaw Pact. They're aligned with the uh, USSR. All oh, this right here would be NATO aligned with the United States. Okay, so A, identify one geopolitical event that initiated change uh, in the number of international boundaries in Europe between 1980 and 2013. Um, there's two that you could put here, uh, the Cold War and also balkanization of Yugoslavia. Okay, because notice that's a big part of this as well. So there is um, your, your countries that existed so here would be Yugoslavia, and then here's the countries that are there after the breakdown of that in the 1990s. So that's those are the two things that I feel like would get you a point for part A. It would be worth one point. Um, and definitely, if I think that this right here is the best because it results in tremendous, tremendous change in the international boundaries there in the Balkans. So that's definitely the one that I know will get you a point. Cold War probably would as well. You cannot list Germany's defeat in World War II. Simply, that happened way before 1980. So I know, no, no, uh, a lot of students are going to lose points because surely they, they listed that. Um, especially when you look at Germany and you see here that Germany is broken down into um, Eastern and Western Germany, which is going to confuse some students um, who are not as related or I guess familiar with the Cold War, they're going to get confused and they're going to say, oh, that's related to World War II. Hopefully that wasn't you guys. All right, that would not get you points. B, explain how nationalism can eliminate international boundaries. Describe an example from the maps shown. Okay, so you got your centripetal forces and we talked about how strong, that strong nationalism can both be something that is a unifying force as well as something that breaks people apart. So you've got centripetal and centrifugal forces here, um, and they're directly related to nationalism. You could use that terminology on this question if you wanted to. Centripetal forces, things that unite people and, and, and uh, in other words, eliminate, right, eliminate international boundaries. People bound by national identity desire for autonomy, right? A really good example of this would be um, perhaps Ukraine, and the other Warsaw Pact states, all these different, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, they, these are, hang on, eliminate, can eliminate an international boundary. Um, okay, actually, in hindsight, I don't think this is a good example because this here is going to create them. So I wouldn't put, I wouldn't put that. Um, East Germany is the best example for, for that part. Uh, hands down, you're going to get a point for this. Um, East Germany is a, uh, is uh, Germany was united after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after the fall of the um, of communism, uh, uh, because they are the, this whole place. They're they're German, right? Um, they are nationally German. They speak the same language, have the same culture. Um, they feel very strongly about the same things. They were under different types of governments as a result of the uh, the end of World War II, leading up into the Cold War period. So. When the USSR lost their grip on Germany, on Eastern Germany, uh, the walls fell literally and figuratively, and the, the country was united again as a result of their nationalism. Um, so that's the best example. Part C, explain how nationalism can create new international boundaries. All right, this right here is where you want to be able to talk about the Balkans. Um, describe an example from the maps shown. And you would want to actually, you know, mention that this right here is the Balkans. Uh, uh, this right here is your uh, uh, Yugoslavia that broke down as a result of the process of balkanization due to ethnic conflict and uh, national differences in the region. And here is how that might look. Ethnic differences lead to political breakdown, aka balkanization. Yugoslavia um, was a communist country that once the, the, the leader there died, the linguistic, religious, ethnic differences um, led to uh, wars conflict and ethnic cleansing ultimately redrawing new lines between those countries and so a few of the examples that you have here croats all right they're ethnically different from serbs who are orthodox christians and speak a slavic language who are different from bosnians who were muslim all right now all these guys here are white but religiously ethnically linguistically they're extremely different and you had tons of wars about this i also wrote kosovo now, Kosovo is going to be this right here. All right, that, that's Kosovo. But the reason why I wrote that in is because even though Kosovo is recognized as part of Serbia, 
right? Kosovo is officially part of Serbia. The United States recognizes it as a as a um, sovereign. I, I wouldn't say sovereign nation, but they re they, represent, they recognize it as different from the rest of Serbia. And the people that live there are Kosovar Albanians. So you might could get away with talking about Kosovo as something separate there from Yugoslavia if you wanted to. Um, I, I probably would. Obviously, you want to go with Yugoslavia. Um, you know, so so you know, I wrote that down with question mark beside it. All right, describe two ways supranationalism has affected the functions of international boundaries in Europe. Notice and this right here really isn't going to be necessarily related to the rest of these questions. All right, it doesn't have to be. Uh, and so, in my response, I I didn't I didn't relate it to the rest of the questions. I specifically talked about how the European Union has changed the way boundaries are just, are are um are uh defined in in Europe and the two number one ways I would I would list is no trade barriers so and you even have the same currency in the eurozone not all the EU is going to be the eurozone but it's most countries in the EU that use the euro and though therefore in the region known as the eurozone where they use the euro this is going to save them from having to um, convert currencies which slows down business and international trade and makes the whole, all of Europe collectively um, not as competitive as countries like the United States. Um, and so in the world of globalization, you don't want individual countries like the size of states in the U.S. having to jump through hoops and barriers to travel back and forth and do business. In that same sense, there is going to be relaxed migration between European uh, countries. Again, the, the EU is the thing here because they don't want people having to like i said jump through all these regulations if they're trying to do business for the greater good of the region um i i honestly i, I can tell you i didn't spend a heck of a lot of time on on this question like i did on the rest i can't think of another example of how i would go about answering part b for this without looking at the european union so um does anybody have any like nato examples or anything that john might have put uh, if you do, feel free to drop them in the comments there, and I'll take a look and see. But um, in a nutshell, this right here is th this is my this is my response. This is how I would look at these these questions. Now, one thing that I did want to draw your attention to is right here, I listed out Crimea question mark and I circled the Crimean Peninsula. So let's take a quick look at this and let's look at why I circled that and what I had to say about it. Um, I circled it because in 2014, the the Russia went in and and um just annexed it so it is it, they consider it officially part of russia oh it's never going to be recognized officially as part of russia but in practice it's part of russia for two reasons one uh most of these people in crimea are russian uh ethnically they speak russian they are russian they want to be part of russia um also uh uh, uh this, this here is the concept of what we call irredentism all right, it's a perfect textbook example of irredentism. Um, not really related to the question, but I wanted to put that there so you can see it. The reason why I don't think this would get you any points if you talked about it is because notice that the, the map doesn't demonstrate a change in the boundary between Crimea and the rest of of um of Ukraine. So I, I don't think I would spend time talking about Crimea as an example of how boundaries may have changed in this particular question. So if you did that. I don't think you're going to get a point for it. And probably most people didn't do this, but I don't know. Leo, I don't know, man. I, but I'll tell you what. <laughs> I think that the the East Coast, um, I think the East Coast questions were the better questions to get. Again, I'm not saying that because I think it's going to have any impact on your scores. I, do, I really do feel like they're going to have a fair way of balancing that out. And the reason I, I agree fully with what they're doing. Again, the reason why you had – um, three questions on the West Coast that were different from the three questions on the East Coast is because kids on the East Coast are going to be finishing up and putting it all on Twitter what they did. Um, and you can't police that. You know, and it gives the West Coast an unfair advantage unless they get completely different questions. Yeah. So, Leo, if you get a chance, um, go back and look at uh, the earlier part of, of this video. I talked about those questions um, in the same level of detail as I did these um, last three on the West Coast. So um, you can go back and see – Kind of my thoughts on those uh, if you wanted to again the marking guide will come out sometime over the summer so you guys you know when you get your scores that would be a really good time to go back and check if you google APHG 
uh, FRQ uh, uh, 2019, you'll be able to go back and look at the marketing guide and see exactly how they're graded, and then you, you'll know. You know, you'll, you'll know. Um, it's been great being able to see you guys again. Uh, it took me about an hour and ten minutes, so a little bit longer than I wanted to on this, but uh, that's okay. Honestly, it took me a little longer because I, I didn't realize whenever I signed up to do it that there was going to be six questions, and that's all well and good. Um, if you if y'all have any other questions for me, uh, let me know. And other than that, I'm going to go ahead and um, go tell my oldest good night and get myself ready for bed as well, so I can do it all again tomorrow. Wait, wait, wait. What you got? You want me to look at that question or that uh, FRQ? Yeah, let me go take a look at it real quick. I'm going to put it on screen one so I can see you guys. All right, so these here are the scoring guidelines. All right, so you're looking at super nationalism. This is here the one you're talking about. Yeah, um, and and development below it. Okay, so let's take a look. I scrolled down too far, didn't I? Question one. All right. So uh, next question two. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, you're you're right. They um. They did. Yeah. So so. I mean, and honestly, it's, it's, it's very, very similar in the way they set it up, isn't it? So, I mean, maybe it's because the question is um, is so old. 2005 was, heck, man, I was only at, I was about to graduate college, you know, undergrad. I was about to, under, uh, to graduate undergrad in 2005. Um, so so I'd, I'd only been graduated. I graduated high school in 2001. So this here is a, is a very old question, and perhaps that's the reason why they reused the topic of devolution and supranationalism. Um, and also, I feel like maybe the reason why is simply due to the fact that it's so applicable in our globalized world today. I mean, things have changed a pretty good bit. I will say, though, that that's kind of shocking the way they went about it. It's, it's very, very similar, um, even to, down to the examples that you could give with the breakdown of Yugoslavia and the Balkans. So um, that's interesting. Um, I can't say for sure that they've never reused the topic. Honestly, I'm, I'm terrible. Like, I'll get ready for the AP exam and I'll look at all these old FRQs and then I just about immediately forget what year and what topic. So a lot of AP human driver teachers can remember this stuff and I always tend to forget. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm eager to see the marking guide and see how similar at the end of the day these questions are. Let me see if I can actually read the question. Define supranationalism. Define, uh, provide an example. Define devolution for an example. Yeah, so this here is literally the same thing is what they asked for for the first part of that question that we just looked at. Um, I would think that this right here, uh, process whereby regions of a state demand and gain political strength by growing autonomy at the expense of the central government, that's more or less the same as what I gave you, um, just a different way of saying it. So yeah, if you put that, you definitely are going to to, to be okay. I wouldn't have thought that the, that balkanization would be an acceptable definition of devolution because balkanization is more extreme. You look at devolution as something like what Great um, uh, the United Kingdom has gone through, but you look at something like balkanization being like the violent breakdown of, of a region like Yugoslavia as a result of ethnic clashes. Um, let's see, what should be the exact same, but sadly, sadly, sadly but uh, creation of new state put. All right, yeah. So I don't think that that would, would, would work, to be honest, um, because it's got, in my mind, it's got to be connected to the, to, at the expense of the central government. And I think that's the main thing that you got to think about with the definition of devolution there. Um, and, and, and again, this is a different co a question, different rubric, uh, but it is <laughs> it's the exact same thing, define devolution. So I, I don't know how they would have it marked one way here and then on a different rubric mark it some other way. So, um, so, so Leo, hopefully some of your buddies there actually put it together in the context of uh, breaking down a central government. So um, hopefully it won't be as bad as, as it may seem. And, and I hope that having this discussion with you guys gave you a little bit more confidence about what you put in the paper and not the opposite. So um, nevertheless, it is what it is. No use in worrying about it now. You'll get your scores back somewhere around the beginning of July. I think it's usually between July 5th. And like some, sometime that week, depending on what time the uh, the scores are released. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, this usually it's after July 4th. So I'm not really sure. But nevertheless, somewhere in that time period, another live stream in July. Man, maybe so. I told uh, 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 Miss Amanda that I'm, I'm, uh, I'll stay on. I don't know if I'll uh, do a, a weekly thing, but um, but I would definitely stay on with Bible. So uh, you guys 
I don't know. You, you may see that. That may happen. Uh, we'll just we'll see what we'll see what happens, and uh, and I'll play along. So great. Um, have a great summer, guys. Don't fret about this. What's done is done. Ain't no use worrying about it. But definitely go and check your scores. All right. Um, your teacher should give you information on that. If not, you can Google how to check your scores and 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 do that. Don't just sit back and not know. Okay. Find out what you did and learn from it. And when you take AP World History, Bible is going to be here for you and you guys can look at what you learned in this course and say, even if I didn't get college credit, I learned a heck of a lot about the world in which I live. And that's what's really important. That's what that's why you take an AP class. It's not just for a college credit, but man, I promise you're gonna see this stuff again in world history. You're gonna see it in AP Euro, you're gonna see it in uh, AP US history, you're gonna see it in college, and you're gonna live it whenever you get old enough to watch the news and say, we talked about that in AP Human Geography. I promise it's worth it. So enjoy your summer and I will see you guys next time.